Uh, so welcome everyone to the second book talk of our fall semester. Uh, I see a lot of new, new faces, so at least uh, I haven't seen you uh, attend uh, Tang Center events before, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Sanjot Mahendale and I'm the chair of the Tang Center for Silk Road uh, Studies. Uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome Professor Shinwen. Uh, to discuss his recent book, which I will hand out, uh, called The King's Road, Diplomacy and the Remaking of the Silk Road. Um, for those of you, uh, by the way, who are interested in uh, some of our other talks and events, uh, you can just go to the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies website, and you'll see that next week we have a very interesting conference slash workshop on the oasis of Kucha. Uh, Monica Zinn uh, will be giving a keynote uh, on Thursday, November 2nd, and that will be followed Friday morning uh, by a symposium or, or conference where uh, four scholars will be discussing their work on, on uh, the Kucha Oasis. Uh, so I hope you know, you'll continue to join us uh, for that. Um, back to our speaker, Professor Xinwen received his BA from the University of Science and Technology of China and an MA in pre-modern Chinese history from Peking uh, University. Subsequently, he came to the United States where he completed an MA in East Asia Studies and a PhD in Inner Asian and Altaic Studies at Harvard University. And since 2017, he has been an assistant professor of East Asian Studies and History at Princeton University. Uh, Professor uh, Xinwen has published uh, many articles on the history of China and Inner Asia and is currently working on a second book, or his second book tentatively titled Chang'an, The Death and Rebirth of China's Eternal Capital, 900 to 1400. He's also working on a joint study and a select translation of a large cache of more than 120,000 third century documents from uh, Zumalu. Uh, to be published by Brill. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, how extraordinary it is to have a find of 120,000 uh, manuscripts. Uh, it's his first book, however, The King's Road, published this year by Princeton University Press that has brought him here today. Um, this work, for those who don't know it yet, though haven't had a chance to read it yet, provides a detailed look into the social history of the lives of diplomatic travelers along the Silk Road uh, during the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th century. Uh, based on close reading of 9th and 10th century documents discovered in the so-called Dunhuang Library um, and excavating pieces of information on the long distance journey made by travelers of different backgrounds, which is what is contained in this book. Um, this book is a very welcome addition to the still sparse microscale scholarship on the nature of these networks of communication, teasing out their characteristics um, uh, on the ground and placing uh, them in space and time. Among the many issues that are addressed in the book, I just wanted to highlight, because you're going to talk about the book anyway, two things that really stood out to me. Uh, once again, the importance of continued multidisciplinary research on the Dunhuang manuscripts and other locally produced and contemporaneous writings, in particular those that are not studied well or that are not really called very broadly. Um, very important, I think, in understanding conditions on the ground along the Eurasian networks of exchange. And the second thing that stood out to me and uh, dear to my heart was the defense of the, in academia, much maligned terms, Silk Road. Uh, not as an anachronism, but one that, uh, at least uh, uh, in your estimation, accurately describes historical awareness of existing networks of roads, as well as the things that moved along it. In other words, large quantities of silk. Uh, so thank you for that, because I'm always kind of explaining why uh, our center is named term, you know, the Center for Silk Road Studies. Uh, why? Because it's such, you know, it is argued such a romanticized and colonial term. But thank you for that defense in your book. Um, so uh, I will stop there. Uh, please help me welcome Professor Xinwen. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and for the invitation and for hosting this event. And um, 
uh, Sanju and also uh, Frank for uh, communicating with me on the logistics and, and uh, the support. And thank you all for coming on a beautiful Friday afternoon where you can be doing a assortment of fun things uh, in, in, <laughs> in Berkeley. Um, so uh, uh, the talk today is titled, uh, the title is essentially the same as the title of the book. Uh, the thing that you would notice is that I added the time uh, uh, at the end of the title. This was in the book manuscript, uh, but then my editor told me to cut it because you know, I, the goal is to pretend that this is a, a broader book than it actually is, and I think it sort of, uh, 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 the result is that some people might accidentally bought it for reasons that uh, they would eventually regret. Um, but this is a more, the, that is to say, honest title, uh, that this is not a book about the Silk Road in a way that a lot of other books that are, are, are about the Silk Road are. Uh, which is our uh, which are big surveys of you know hundreds sometimes thousands of years. Uh, it is a book that's focused on pretty much one place uh, in this 150 year period. So uh, this is what it looks like, uh, and I'll get to the argument and why I titled the book this way uh, in uh, the course of the talk. But as you can see that this is essentially a book about the Silk Road. Um, so to write a book about the Silk Road, or to, to write another book about the Silk Road, really needs some justification, because there are so many uh, uh, books on the, on the topic. And partly it's because the thing that we associate with this idea is so uh, broad, right? This is, I just randomly picked this uh, visualization, this, this map that purportedly show the Silk Road. As you can see, it covers uh, in some, uh, at least in this visualization, essentially the entire, uh, uh, entire Eurasian continent. So, the, so one of the things that I'm doing in this book is to try to think more critically about the concept uh, of the Silk Road. Uh, where it comes from, should we continue using it? If yes, why? If not, uh, what are some alternatives? Uh, just to you know, very briefly review the history of this term, um, many of you probably are familiar with this. Uh, Ferdinand von Gestoffen is the person who at least systematized uh, the concept of the Silk Road, uh, the history of the Silk Road, even though uh, there uh, are some more recent research that has shown that before he, quote unquote, invented this term in 1877, in German academia, there have been uh, sporadic references to this term, to this uh, uh, word. Um, he is still, I would argue, the first person to systematically describe what he thought uh, the Silk Road or the uh, Zeidenstrasse uh, uh, meant. So I'm still calling him the inventor or the, the an initiator of this concept. Um, and you know, I can give a whole lecture about what uh, this term uh, the, the way that this term evolved con or continued to evolve uh, over the past uh, century and a half. Uh, and that I think there are scholars who are working on that, uh, working on exactly this issue. But I'm just going to jump right ahead back uh, to, I guess I'm still calling this the present, even though both of these books have been out for 10 years plus, 10 plus years. Um, to look at some more recent uh, work. So basically, you know, more than 100 years after uh, the term was first conceived of, now when we use the word the Silk Road, uh, a lot of people, a lot of scholars, a lot of uh, uh, lay people uh, use it to kind of mean, you know, in the cases of both of these 
uh, works uh, global history, the history that's connected, that's not uh, defined by national boundaries, um, and uh, uh, that are, you know, roughly speaking, based uh, uh, or that's happening on the Eurasian continent. So it's a very expensive term that uh, that are used often fairly loosely, and that is why there are critical push against this term. Um, so here I'm quoting one uh, uh, a very famous uh, archaeologist, Warwick Ball, uh, in his Rome in the East, said that, or claimed that there is not a single ancient historical record, neither Chinese nor classical, that even hints at the existence of such a road, the Silk Road, that is. So. Um, so here we have two very different vision or different attitude towards this term. On the one hand, there are scholars who use the word so expensively that it essentially becomes a um, synonym for global history. On the other hand, there are people who argue that uh, there isn't even a trace of it. Uh, it's just you know uh, something that's invented in the 19th century and we really shouldn't use it to describe pre-modern uh, uh, phenomena. So the goal, or one goal of my book is to kind of try to find a way out of this quagmire. Uh, how, do we, uh, how do we test to see if this term is really a valid term or not? And the way I do it is to look at one small place. And that small place is, uh, uh, is the library cave in Dunhuang. I'll, I'll get to that uh, in a little bit. And in this very small place, I try to uh, ask two fairly broad questions. First is exactly what I was just talking about. Was there a Silk Road? Is this something that we can observe uh, in Dunhuang? Uh, and then the second sort of connected connected question is, if there was a Silk Road, I guess you know, if the answer to the first question is no, then there isn't uh, the second question. But, but you, can, so you, you already know what my answer to the second question is, uh, to the first question is. right. So if there was a Silk Road, or there was something that we can uh, you know, reasonably call the Silk Road, what exactly was it? Um, so these are pretty simple questions. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I used the materials from the Dunhuang Library Cave uh, in order to uh, address them. So uh, just to give you a brief uh, uh, review or, or uh, kind of um, introduction to uh, where Dunhuang is, uh, so Dunhuang or was. Uh, Dunhuang is essentially uh, this place that's located on uh, the road that leads from central China to into uh, uh, Central Asia. It's at the western edge of the Hexi Corridor. Uh, after Dunhuang, the road sort of branches out into several uh, sub uh, uh, branches. And Dunhuang is the center of my book. Uh, but there are, uh, because the book is about the Silk Road, it's about travelers. I also talk about, you know, you had to you can't just be in Dunhuang if you're a traveler. So there are a bunch of other places that I also talk about in the book and in the talk today uh, that I want to introduce to you. Uh, so in the east, I marked two places, uh, Chang'an, which was the capital of the Tang Dynasty in China, Kaifeng, the capital of the Northern, Northern Song Dynasty, uh, and then around Dunhuang, uh, you have places like Turfan, Khotan, Kashgar, uh, Ganzhou, and especially Turfan, Khotan, and Ganzhou, uh, they were all uh, oases kingdoms like Dunhuang in this period of time. Uh, they were all um, of different uh, uh, ethnic and cultural affiliations. Khotan, Khotan is you know, a place where uh, Kodani is a Middle Iranian language is used, whereas Ganjo and Turfan in this time were both, uh, at least the ruling class, were both Uyghur, um, whereas Dunhuang 
Dunhuang's ruling class was primarily Chinese uh, uh, after the uh, middle of the 9th century. So this, these are the places, some of the places that I will be uh, mentioning in this talk. Um, and Dunhuang is, so I choose Dunhuang as the focus of this research uh, um, because, or partly because of the centrality of its location, right? It's, it's very centrally located uh, on the Silk Road, as you can see. Uh, but that's not the only reason or the main reason. The main reason is really that we have a lot of uh, documentation for the history of Dunhuang in this period. And that is because of these caves. So this is sort of uh, the, uh, the cave complex called the Mogao Cave Complex outside of the city of Dunhuang now. Uh, and if you, and, and as you can see, there are hundreds of caves. Uh, and, and for uh, um, our historian, uh, you know, we're all uh, familiar with these caves, and many of them have really uh, important mural paintings. Uh, there, there are, you know, 300 or so of them. Um, but I'm really only looking at this one cave, a very small cave. Uh, now it's called cave number 17. It's probably the size of that corner, uh, that kitchen area uh, of, this, uh, of this room. So it's a very small cave compared to many of the much larger caves in the Dunhuang, uh, in the Mogao Cave complex. But it is important because in 1900, this person, Wang Yuanlu, who was a Taoist monk, discovered, uh, and this is Paul Pelio uh, sitting in front of it, uh, this cave which was uh, uh, kind of walled up and hidden on the side of a much larger cave uh, that was knocked down by uh, Wang Yuanlu in, uh, the wall was knocked down by Wang Yuanlu in 1900 uh, that revealed all these uh, uh, manuscripts that were hidden uh, behind it. Uh, we still don't necessarily know, uh, and, and actually there was a, a long email debate or discussion uh, or that I was uh, uh, having with some colleagues uh, uh, Sam Feng Sheik and, and Valerie Hansen, and uh, we're discussing, you know, what do we know about the, com uh, the composition of this, uh, this corpus? Uh, there's still some uh, disagreement. I think my evaluation probably should change a, quite a bit. I think Tibetan documents probably would account for, I mean, I would, I'm curious to, to, to know what, uh, what uh, Professor Dalton thinks, uh, probably accounts for 20 to 30 percent of all the uh, Dunhuang documents, but the majority of the documents that, are, or the manuscript that were found in the cave, uh, were in Chinese, and they're uh, Chinese Buddhist texts. And then, um, and and by the way, there are, you know, about altogether maybe 70,000 uh, manuscripts, um, uh, give it, give or take. Um, and then, you know, in addition to the Chinese document, of course, you also have Tibetan uh, manuscripts. Uh, uh, my count here is low, but I think there are more, more than that. Um, uh, some of the most important Tibetan uh, documents in the world, such as uh, this, you know, early, uh, the oldest Tibetan historical account, Tibetan annals, uh, were uh, discovered in Dunhuang in that library cave. There are also texts in other uh, lesser known languages, such as Codanese, as I mentioned, Middle Iranian language. Here is an envoy report uh, in Sogdian, a Uyghur. And there's one text, uh, which is a prayer book uh, in, in Hebrew. Um, so this is sort of the contour of the uh, collection. And, and, and here I kind of zoom out a little bit more to put Dunhuang on the map. Uh, sorry, this map is in Chinese, but um, to show kind of the temporal dimension of this collection. So we all know where Dunhuang is now, right? The manuscripts that are preserved in Dunhuang, and if we you know, trust the argument of some scholars, the earliest one is probably, it could be this text, this. Buddhist text that's from the, could also be this other, if we think that particular item is fake, then uh, something from the uh, early 
uh, uh, from the late fourth century at least, uh, or, or fifth century. So uh, the document that you have, or the manuscript you have from the cave date to fairly early uh, time period, but the overwhelming majority of them, especially the secular documents, date to uh, uh, after uh, around 850. So 848 is when the um, local, uh, I guess I, I need to tra uh, trace back a little bit. So during the Tang Dynasty, um, Dunhuang was initially part of the Tang. And then in late, uh, uh, in the late um, 8th century, so 780s, it was conquered by the Tibetan Empire and became a part of the Tibetan Empire. And then starting from 848, uh, a local uh, elite uh, warlord overthrew the Tibetan uh, rule and, and the Tibetan Empire was disintegrating and um, established a kind of uh, uh, independent state in Dunhuang itself. So that is the point, uh, if you look at the document, uh, when there was an explosion, at least in terms of the documents that's preserved in uh, this cave, that the overwhelming majority of the documents that we have from this cave date to the period between 850 and 1000. And this is an interesting time period because if you think about Chinese history, the Tang Dynasty uh, ended in 907, the Song Dynasty began in 960, uh, and uh, this is a map of the period in between, which is called the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms. You don't need to know anything about it, just judging from the name, you know it's a time of political fragmentation uh, that's represented here. And this is the reason why uh, often people think of this period also as a period of declining connections. Um, so what Dunhuang documents allows us to see, uh, therefore, because of the time that they're, uh, they're from, uh, what the world looked like when the Tang Dynasty was declining. Uh. So what do they tell us about the Silk Road? Uh, the way I kind of go about trying to answer this question is that I I'm using Dunhuang documents, or documents from the Dunhuang uh, Library Cave, to try to reconstruct the world of medieval long distance travelers, to see what uh, and how, uh, what they were doing, when they travel, how they're uh, uh, traveling. Um, and, uh, and it turned out that there are a lot of different sources that you can use to reconstruct this world. And so now I will walk you through, uh, pretend that, you know, just imagine that you're planning a trip from Dunhuang to, I don't know, Chang'an to the Chinese capital, right, uh, in the Tang. Um, before you even start, uh, we have sources t that tell you that people, that the way that people approach uh, these trips, uh, 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 such as uh, uh, this text, which I'm calling a prophecy book, which is essentially a text that tells you what are the right days to do certain things. And these things include long distance travel. For instance, the entry that I highlighted here tells you that there will be wine and meat waiting for you uh, if you go east today. And it will be auspicious to go south. Um, but you will be delayed if you go west and north today. Uh, so these are the texts that the travelers, I would argue, consulted before they uh, started their journey. And then, you know, on the basis of this and other types of texts, they can decide on, uh, 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 on the right uh, time to start their journey. Another kind of preparation is more material. Um, in order to travel on the Silk Road, uh, you know, you, uh, I'm sure you all know, you need support such as, such as camels. So here we have an example where a traveler uh, was serving as a diplomatic, uh, as a diplomat for the Dunhuang state and was traveling into the capital. Uh, so we don't know what date this document is. So it could be uh, uh, the Tang capital or the Song capital. So it could be Chang'an or Kaifeng. Either case, he was 
going to be traveling for uh, quite some distance. And in this contract, he was borrowing one camel uh, from uh, some other people in Dunhuang for, uh, to prepare for this trip. So this aspect of the, uh, uh, the journey is, uh, is obviously also very important. And in fact, I, uh, in the book, I have a chapter about how these non-human things, such as, well, I guess you know, sometimes I get pushed back when I call them non-human things. They're non-human entities. Uh, such as camels, but also uh, uh, books, silk, uh, 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 how these non-human entities actually also traveled. And their stories are, are just as interesting as the human travelers. Um, and then uh, another type of preparation you had to do uh, when you, uh, or before you, um, uh, pre before you start your journey is more social. Uh, and here we have this very interesting document uh, called the, uh, which is a stipulation for a society for long distance travelers. Um, so essentially in Dunhuang, uh, local people organize into mutual help groups to support one another when someone needs to travel uh, for a long distance. Uh, the stipulation here says for those who travel for more than a thousand li, which is about 300 miles, uh, a, on the day of the departure for trips that were for government matters, uh, each member of the society should deliver one urn of wine upon their successful return. Each should arrange at the welcoming banquet two urns of wine. Um, so there is this system in which uh, people who are not traveling were supporting people who, uh, who were. Um, and then, you know, once you start your journey, uh, you need another kind of support, uh, which is what I'm calling road guide. Uh, obviously, at the time, they didn't have the kind of uh, uh, GIS sort of guides that we have right now, uh, but there were effective means through which uh, these travelers can orient themselves. So here is uh, one example. This is the text called, called A Path to India. It is essentially a um, account of the uh, journey or a journey from the Song capital, uh, Kaifeng, all the way to India, uh, presumably for Buddhist uh, travelers. And I've uh, collected the information and visualized them on the map. Uh, and as you can see, so it basically tells you, you leave from Kaifeng and then you go after 4,000 li uh, uh, to uh, uh, Lingzhou. Uh, this is another, uh, this is the town at the Song border. And then after 20 days, you get to Ganzhou. And after five days, uh, you get to the next place, so on and so forth. Um, so you would notice that this type of guide is very, it's very big picture, right? It doesn't really tell you what you should be doing on a daily basis, where you should, you know, turn at the next intersection. What it does tell you is uh, that if you have this guide, you can sort of check once you get to your next stop to make sure that you're roughly on the same, on the, on the right path. Right. Once you get to your next stop, you can ask, is this Ganjo or not? The guy says that I'm supposed to be in Ganjo, uh, uh, am I right? So it's still useful uh, for travelers in that way. But there are also more specific guides for uh, uh, specific smaller sections of the road. And here uh, I'm quoting from one geographical text from Dunhuang where it says, that the road from the stone garrison, which is a place between Dunhuang and Kotan, so to the south, uh, southwest of Dunhuang. Uh, so the road from this place to Dunhuang that goes through uh, the Yang, old Yang Pass. So this is sort of the road that this particular text is talking about. And, and there are other roads. Uh, so for this road, this text tells us that <clears throat> It edges many precipitous places, so it's dangerous uh, uh, path to to travel through. Um, but there are eight springs on the road, 
uh, that you can use for, as water, uh, water source. Uh, and all of them p possess grassland uh, nearby, which means that you can not only feed your horses, you can also um, uh, water, you can also uh, have places where they can graze. Um, and the road is treacherous and cannot be passed at night. It's dangerous, again. And in the two seasons of spring and fall, the road is overrun with snow and not passable. So here you have a very concrete guide that tells you the condition of the road, when you should travel, right? what season, what time of the day, and uh, whether you need to carry water with you on the road, or if there are uh, water sources uh, 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 there available. Obviously, also very important and, and uh, necessary information. Socially, you also needed uh, to establish relationship with people on the road, right? Because dan the danger often don't, don't come from uh, uh, natural forces, but, but from the people that you will see. So that is why we have uh, a text like this. Uh, and this, this document has been studied uh, thoroughly by uh, Sam Fengsheik and uh, uh, Imre Glombus in their book, Manuscripts and Travelers. And, and here I'm just quoting, it's an introduction letter between two Tibetan monks about a Chinese monk who was traveling from China to India, uh, where uh, it says, may I ask a favor regarding a Chinese monk? who has been in my presence. The monk wishes to go to India to see the relics of Shakyamuni and please uh, provide accommodation and assist him uh, on his journey. And you can imagine that many of the travelers on the Silk Road must have had similar uh, types of documents uh, uh, as they proceeded. And once they arrived at a place, uh, and this is sort of a really interesting uh, uh, thing that I, I don't, I didn't discover it. I didn't discover really anything, and all these texts have been read. But that I realized um, was that there are all these uh, documents about the provisioning of things to travelers uh, in Dunhuang, which meant which meant that uh, uh, you know if you read it from the traveler's perspective, when they get to a certain place. Uh, they actually get stuff from their local host. And here's one example, and, and the, the highlighted parts were all uh, referring to different diplomatic travelers here, envoys from Khotan, envoys from Ganzhou. And these were, and, and here is a, is a, um, a reference to uh, wine that's sent to uh, someone to, uh, uh, who is traveling themselves. Too. Um, so this is the list of wine distribution from the Dunhuang government. And from this list, we can see that the government gave wine to various kinds of social uh, settings. Uh, you know, religious activities, gatherings, uh, the government will provide wine for them. But one of them is that uh, these diplomatic travelers from other states, when they get to Dunhuang, they were given wine on a daily basis. Um, and we have other documents showing that they were provided with food, uh, they were provided with accommodation, and here is one where it tells you that they were provided with uh, paper. Uh, so I'm just quoting one, uh, uh, one line. So one shu and eight tie, which is about 900 sheets of fine paper, were given to the embassy of this particular person, uh, sorry, the envoy, miss it either, the envoy from Khotan. So this diplomatic traveler from Khotan who got to Dunhuang was given, apparently without you know, the request for, uh, for um, reciprocation, uh, uh, for free, that is, uh, in you know, significant uh, uh, number of paper for their, uh, for their use. And all the highlighted parts were uh, these types of travelers. On the other hand, the travelers themselves were also bringing gifts to their host. When they uh, uh, run into uh, people on the road, uh, not run into, but when they encounter people on the road. So here's one example uh, from the envoy in Khotan, or Khotanese envoy, to uh, the lord or the king of Dunhuang 
uh, where it says that uh, the king of Khotan is giving the king of Dunhuang one large piece of white uh, jade, or one piece, or one um, round piece uh, of white jade. Um, so there is this kind of exchange of uh, material that we often associate with the Silk Road, right? Um, uh, but it's happening in the form of gift exchange rather than commercial transaction. Another thing that uh, you know we encounter now on a daily basis, if we travel to a place where we don't speak the language, is how to communicate with people. And this is the same issue as, as I've mentioned, right? People in Khotan were using or speaking a Middle Iranian language. We uh, in uh, Ganjo and, and, and Turfan, they were uh, primarily you know, at least Uyghur in, in the uh, ruling class. And then uh, you have all these Chinese and Tibetan people uh, also existing in this area. So you encounter a lot of people who don't speak your language uh, when you're traveling. What do you do? Uh, among other things, you have these types of texts that are bilingual phrase books uh, discovered in Dunhuang. So this highlighted part, this is actually Chinese. Uh, this is Chinese language written in Brahmi script uh, that uh, if you read it out loud, it means Shu Tang La, Shu Tang La, uh, which means uh, bring the water in Chinese. Um, and then the next sentence uh, uh, says Wu Cha Wa Bala, which means bring the water in Cotonese. So, and you know, it goes on and, and includes a lot of other kind of uh, 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 phrases such as bring the, bring the salt, uh, make food quickly, uh, all the sort of conversation, simple conversation that you would per perhaps need when you're traveling. And uh, by using text like this, and there are other examples right here, is a, uh, some uh, 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 sentences from a Sanskrit Cotonese bilingual phrase book where you know uh, says Guter Gacha see where are you going in Sanskrit and then uh, uh, Cotonese says the same thing so when you have these type of texts obviously uh, you can and and there are you know if you go to the bookstore you can still get uh, uh, phrase books uh, that you know Lonely Planets published that, uh, uh, them that that essentially follow the same uh, logic so by using these, uh, the travelers can navigate, or at least try to navigate, the linguistic uh, landscape of the Silk Road. They send uh, and delivered uh, uh, private letters for people when they're traveling. And so this is something that's quite interesting. As I've I kind of mentioned, this is a politically fragmented uh, world. Uh, the places that they're traveling through, they're they belong to different uh, uh, political authorities. Uh, but one thing I observed is that these travelers often served as essentially uh, mailmen. They, they send the letters uh, that people wrote to somebody else uh, in a different place. Uh, they deliver them and they, uh, they sort of uh, tra travel with the letter uh, for, the tra uh, for, for, for these people. Here's one example of a letter that's written by a monk in Turfan to several of his peers, uh, other monks in Dunhuang, um, that was delivered by uh, a diplomatic traveler between these two places, where it says, now with the departing envoy, I'm sending you a slight and local gift, uh, which is three uh, pieces, three watermelons uh, from the western land, from uh, Turfan. Uh, And uh, here's another uh, example of a private letter uh, written uh, by uh, a uh, by two sort of disgruntled parents um, from Ganzhou to to their daughter and uh, and, and son-in-law who are living in Dunhuang. So these two places are about I don't know three maybe 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 five hundred. Uh, kilometers uh, away from each other. So it's not that far on the grand scheme of things, but uh, you know, it's not, it's not uh, very close by either. So this text, this letter was carried, as I quote here, um, uh, by 
diplomat uh, from Dunhuang to Ganzhou, where it says the envoys are flowing like a river, but there's no word from you two. So it's a complaint to the daughter and son-in-law, why haven't you been writing? Why haven't you been communicating with me? And this letter was delivered by these travelers. In addition to that, the travelers often also wrote official reports. And here is uh, a part of many, actually, uh, 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 really interesting Cotonese uh, envoy reports that are preserved in the Dunhuang Cave. Uh, here I'm just quoting one sentence where it talks about the condition of the road from Suzhou, is, which is closed by the Tatars, by their presence, or by their weight. And now, apart from a bird in the air, the envoys of another man, of another state, that is, uh, has no passage. So no one can travel through. And these type of information, sending back to their home country, uh, would uh, be crucial as they uh, plan, as, as people plan their future uh, trips. Of course, you also have, as you do now, a graffiti that these uh, travelers left. And here's one example. And this is not a manuscript. This is, uh, uh, you know, the, this is a line that's left uh, on the wall of uh, uh, one of the caves, not in this main complex, but somewhere else in Dunhuang, uh, where it basically tells you what these people were doing. They were visiting a sacred relic site uh, in the year 900. Uh, so, you know, you go sort of travel and you, vis uh, you visit the, the, the state that you are, are supposed to be visiting. You go to see uh, these sites. Um, so we can sort of get to know all these different aspects of the life of travelers. Uh, uh, a final thing on this journey or on the journey that you're, you're doing is that uh, you also need to provide a a uh, note of gratitude for your host uh, after you leave or when you leave. And here is an example that expresses exactly that. Um, uh, and this is, importantly, a letter model. It's not a real letter. We actually find real letters that are uh, written in exactly the same way, meaning that people are actually using these models. Um, and th with this, uh, you can say that this one leg of the journey uh, is complete. So this is sort of what I'm trying to do with the book, which is to use the very rich uh, information that's contained in the document uh, to reconstruct how people lived in Dunhuang. So this is objectively kind of the, the, the meat of the book, which is the social history of traveling. But what exactly is the significance of this? Um, this is what I, I, I will talk about for the rest of the talk. Uh, does it help us answer the question, was there a Silk Road? I've talked to you a lot about you know, various bits of information about how people traveled, right? Does it help us answer these big questions? And here I quote some, uh, uh, I quote Justin Jacobs, who is a you know, great scholar who's written uh, many interesting things among which the, uh, uh, the most recent is called the compensation of plunder, which is about the, how the, uh, uh, these Dunhuang documents get uh, uh, looted or, or uh, moved to uh, outside China. Uh, in an article for the uh, Oxford Research Encyclopedia, uh, he said that the Silk Road is a purely modern intellectual construct one that would have been utterly unfamiliar and likely incomprehensible to those historical agents it purports to describe. Again, this is another example of people essentially arguing that this is a 19th century concept that, uh, you know, that people, that, 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 that the people that were using it uh, to describe not only, you know, like Huawei Ball said, uh, not only produced no record that make reference to the Silk Road, they would not even understand it uh, when we, you know, it would be incomprehensible uh, to the historical agent, to the people at the time. So this is sort of the kind of argument that I'm trying to uh, assess. This is now I'm zooming out from the travelers, uh, uh, the detailed stories, to the broader kind of mentality 
uh, of people in Dunhuang. So how do you assess that? Uh, I think one of the things to think about this is to look at literature, actually. Um, and here I have a song that is performed in the New Year's Day festival uh, in Dunhuang that is recorded uh, with this song, you know, would be, or some version of it, would be something that people sang uh, as they prayed for a, uh, the, uh, a, a more pro prosperous new year. So I'll, I'll read a few lines from this song, where it says, the 10,000 commoners sing songs with their belly completely filled. So everyone's happy, they have enough to eat. And the time that they lived in resembled that of the Shun and Yao, which are the two uh, uh, sage kings in China's antiquity. Please do not worry, uh, the singer uh, continued to say, about the eastern road being blocked. In the spring, the heavenly envoys will arrive and they will offer large jin silk and coil, with coiled dragons and different kinds of silk and textile. This is talking about the eastern uh, side of Dunhuang. Uh, eastern neighbors of Dunghua. And then it says, to the west all the way into Yukotan, the road will be smoother than that covered uh, by, uh, with cotton. And these envoys will offer treasured artifacts and white jade and a thousand pieces of cotton, silk, and miscellaneous cloth, all within the border of Dunghua. As a result of all the contributions from both sides, uh, chant the, happiness, the song of happiness, and enjoy the long life like Peng Zhu, who uh, supposedly lived for 800 years. So if you look at this song, uh, which was produced in Dunhuang, presumably performed in Dunhuang in front of a lot of people, we see really the key component of the concept of the Silk Road. Uh, in this prayer for a better new year, the singer in Dunhuang was saying that our happiness for the new year in many ways hinges on the continued influx of things like jade, but primarily silk and other textiles from both uh, uh, the east, eastern court, uh, that is central China, and the west. Of course, you know, these people didn't use the term the silk road, but given this sort of mentality, I really would not agree with Justin Jacobs uh, 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 and his assessment that the idea would be completely incomprehensive, uh, incomprehensible uh, to people in Dunhuang. In fact, I think uh, if we can actually talk to them, they would find the concept put, uh, uh, completely meaningful. Uh, uh. So that's sort of the way that I'm trying to argue that we should continue using the term uh, the Silk Road because there, in fact, are pre-modern sources that kind of describe the Silk Road. And people, in fact, probably could understand uh, what it is uh, uh, if we uh, talk to them about it. They are not historians, so they don't theorize about their life. But you know, it's not something that would, would have been uh, 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 impossible to understand. So haven't. Uh, you know, having kind of explained my position or uh, on this issue, uh, the next one is obviously what are we seeing? What's the nature of all the different documents? And collectively, what kind of picture do they present to us? Uh, and this is sort of the, um, the, the question that I'm summarizing as what was the Silk Road? And here I'll just give you three dimensions of this question uh, very quickly. First of all is the nature of this, uh, uh, this network uh, of connections. Uh, we generally think of the Silk Road as a commercial network. Right? This is kind of uh, uh, a pretty uh, well repeated uh, uh, argument that, um, uh, that however, runs contra that or you know contradicts the, is some basic uh, 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 assumptions or basic uh, ideas that we have about Dunhuang. As Valerie Hansen has pointed out, materials from cave number 17, from this cave that I'm using, 
rarely mention merchants. Uh, and my research uh, on these documents essentially confirms her assessment. In the Dunhuang corpus, there are very few references to merchants and, and almost none. Uh, I found one or two that refer to uh, a merchant that was not just local, that was actually traveling to, uh, to, to neighboring states. Uh, so in this sense, we're presented with a problem, right? So on the one hand, there are not a lot of merchants, almost none. Um, at least from Dunhuang documents, uh, but there were a lot of travelers, as I have shown you. So what exactly were they? Um, and here I'll just give you a few examples. This is a uh, Codenese uh, Tibetan bilingual uh, collection of documents. It's a very long document. But at, at one point, uh, the, it includes a Codenese report uh, that says the current trip that these travelers were conducting were the seventh time that two of these envoys were uh, doing between Khotan and Dunhua. So it tells you that this, is, this journey that they're taking is not a rare occasion, right? These two people have done it at least seven times, uh, probably more. Um, so this document, therefore, not only tells us the existence of one diplomatic trip, uh, it tells us that this is a common thing. Uh, here's another example. The text is on the other on the on the other side of this uh, this document. I can't find an image, but it basically tells us that this uh, Dunhuang envoy uh, named Zhang Baoshan served five times as envoys and reached the Nai Fold, which is a reference to the Chinese capital from Dunhuang, uh, in person. Uh, so very similar to the the last example. It tells you the frequency of travel. And in this case, particular, uh, specifically uh, of diplomatic travel. Uh, a third example I'll show you is a Torfan envoy, and this is writing in Uyghur, uh, who said that I have been to the divine state of uh, Yaklakar, which is Ganzhou, uh, once, but I have been to the blessed state of Shadow, which is Dunhuang, four times. Uh, again, attesting to the frequency of diplomatic travels. And here are just a few of the examples that I've collected uh, that shows and, and, you know, the, 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 the pretty simple fact is that most of the long distance travelers you can find in Dunhuang, in the Dunhuang corpus, were traveling for diplomatic purposes. And this discovery or this realization really uh, also uh, kind of uh, point to another aspect of the history of the Silk Road, which is its chronology. And what I mean uh, here is this, uh, and here I quote from Philip Curtin's classic treatment on the subject of you know, cross-cultural trade, uh, where he said Relative, relatively open trade uh, across Asia had occurred uh, in the Han Parthian and Roman period and in the Tang Abbasid period, and then it would happen for a third time in the Mongol Empire. So this view of, you know, he didn't use the word Silk Road, but uh, uh, people have picked up on this, and this is sort of essentially the chronology of the Silk Road. You have highs and lows. Uh, the Tang is a time of highs, and the Mongol period is, at the, uh, is, is another high. Uh, the period in between is a uh, period of lows. Um, The Dunhuang documents obviously date primarily to this period in between the height of the Tang Abbasid period and the Mongol Empire. Are we seeing this decline of, uh, of the Silk Road? That's the question that I'm asking. Uh, and I'm just going to skip that. Mar Mars or Sabi essentially says the same thing. There are four centuries of limited intercultural contact along the Silk Road after the middle of the 9th century, exactly the time period that I'm talking about. Uh, but when you look at Dunhuang documents, uh, the three that I just cited kind of shows that the travels were not only uh, not exceptional, they're routinized, that people would travel to uh, their neighboring states many, many times uh, uh, in their lifetime. Um, here's one example that kind of shows you this connection. 
Uh, this is a report made by a Dunhuang official to the, to the central government in Dunhuang that describes all the Dunhuang envoys that are on the road, uh, at least a collect, a, 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 you know, a group, a, a few, a few uh, a, a group of uh, these envoys that were uh, traveling on the road. He also tells you what was happening in China at the time, and, and the highlighted part shows that they were aware of the fact that Huang Chao, who was the re rebel that o almost overthrew uh, the Tang, uh, was recently killed. So they're gathering political information from the center. Um, but uh, what they tell us is that at the time when the letter was written, so the letter was written by someone who's here, who's in Suzhou and is writing the Dunhuang. It tells you that when the letter was being written, there were four groups of Dunhuang envoys traveling between Dunhuang and Chang'an. One group was in Binzhou, two groups were in Liangzhou, and then one group was in uh, this place called Jialing. What this again tells you is the routinization and frequency of long distance travel that this is exactly the time of, uh, you know, many scholars would say that travel between these places, uh, uh, you know, declined or sometimes even uh, uh, disappeared. Uh, from Dunhuang documents, we know that they uh, never really disappeared. Uh, here's another way of looking at the frequency of these journeys. Um, you know, the Dunhuang government provided wine for these travelers, right? Um, and here you can see that in this year, they provided wine for uh, Torfan envoys for three months, for Cotonese envoys and Ganzhou envoys for uh, all, uh, bo in both cases, for over, two, over 100 days. So these diplomatic travelers were not only traveling very fre frequently. Once they are on the road, they're on the road for a very long time. They're al almost forming a kind of semi-permanent uh, uh, embassy uh, in the places that they, they go. And then, uh, finally, the, the, the other piece of uh, kind of evidence that I collect are from traditional transmitted Chinese sources. I'm not going to go into this very much. Essentially, we see a lot of references to, uh, to uh, long distance travel in these sources as well. So my answer to that question is that, in fact, we don't, there isn't any evidence of uh, a, a decline or precipitous, precipitous decline in terms of the, uh, 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 the interconnection between uh, China and Central Asia in this period. Finally, uh, the question that I want to ask is, what exactly does this do to people? So we talk about the Silk Road, you know, cultural exchange and this and that, and they're all uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, but how does this affect people's life? Um, affect the life of people who are living in this area? So I'll give you an example of another and you know, you notice the pattern here. All the travelers I talk about, almost all of them are diplomatic travelers. Here's another example of a group of envoys who traveled from Dunhuang to Chang'an uh, in 878. And we know about this group because of this document. Uh, they basically wrote a report back to Dunhuang uh, 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 once they completed the first stage of their, uh, tr uh, their, their job. And uh, this document tells us uh, in a fairly comprehensive way where they went, how many people uh, were in this group, and what they did uh, once, they, uh, once they got to Chang'an. Uh, it tells us uh, that this group of travelers brought uh, three items as gifts to the Tang Emperor. So these are gifts from the king of Dunhuang to the Tang Emperor. The first is a piece of jade, and then one antelope horn, and then one uh, yak tail, tail of a yak. So that's all. These are all the things that are included in the gift, uh, gift list. And there are altogether 29 people who traveled on this, uh, in this uh, diplomatic mission. So what 
it tells us, among other things, there are a lot of interesting information. I'm not going to go into the thing I want to look at are the things that these envoys got in return. So the Tang Emperor gave uh, the envoys clothing, silk, and silverware, not only as return gifts to the king of Dunhuang, but also to the envoys themselves. And if we uh, and and they also paid for the uh, travel, uh, uh, the cost of travel, uh, called the using a term called the cost of camels and horses uh, for the travelers. If we uh, put them all together, you can see that the counter gifts from the Dunhuang from the Tang Emperor uh, amounted to uh, uh, 1,800 p of silk. Uh, uh, 42 sets of clothing, and then 19 pieces of silverware for these uh, envoys. And one piece of silk is about 12 meters, so you get a sense of how much is uh, being given. And if we look at the person on an individual basis, the per obviously the, the gift is you know ranked by, uh, is, is differentiated by rank. The higher your rank, the more you got from the Tang Emperor. The person, the lowest status envoy in this group, uh, still received almost 50p of silk and one cotton, uh, one cotton clothing, one set of cotton clothing. And I did this sort of thought experiment because uh, in Dunhuang there are a lot of contracts that are preserved that tells you how much things were worth. Uh, at the time, obviously, you know things, the value of things change, but we get a rough idea of where the value resides, and and basically a simple question: How much uh, stuff can you get with 50 p of silk uh, in Dunhuang? And it turned out that you can get a lot, uh, and you know it essentially equates to uh, 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 about 1,300 shi of grains that would uh, be, uh, uh, you know, uh, on average, about the tw 26 years of, of, of yearly income of a uh, actually quite well-off family in Dunhuang from farming. Uh, it could buy you, according, you know, on the basis of this, uh, these two contracts of house purchase, uh, 20 houses, uh, and uh, uh, it could ha hire a man to work for you for 55 years, and it could uh, get you enough food to feed an adult uh, male for 165 uh, years. So these are kind of insane numbers that obviously, I'm, I'm not trying to argue that this envoy took the silk and bought someone, uh, you know, and, and, and fed someone for 165 years. The point is to show that the amount of stuff that they're getting is economically meaningful, is significant, is, uh, you would argue, life-altering amount of wealth. And that is why people were taking huge financial risks to try to join diplomatic missions. And here's just one example. Someone was, uh, again, borrowing, a, uh, borrowing one piece of silk to fund his diplomatic journey. And in, his, in this contract, it tells us that when he comes back, he will pay two piece. So the interest rate is essentially 100%. Uh, um, so you can sort of think of them as these sort of almost like gamblers, uh, really uh, uh, playing, with, uh, playing with money. And, and, and from this, you can assess or you can in, in, infer that uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, profit uh, to be gained uh, by uh, traveling as a, as a diplomat. And this is another thing I'm, I'm, I'm getting uh, to the end uh, that I want to point out, and this is a, a work by uh, Eric uh, uh, Tompe, who um, collected all the contracts in Dunhuang that he could find. There are a few more. This was published in the 80s, I think. Um, uh, uh, that there are a few more that have been uh, identified, but essentially from what he discovered, uh, out of the 47 contracts that he studied, he discovered in Dunhua, 19 of them, because these contracts, is, they're essentially about, you know, either I'm borrowing something from you or I'm buying something from you, 
they would often say at the beginning, uh, I'm doing this for X reason. Um, they don't always say it, but they often would. Uh, and of the 47 contracts that we have from Dong Huang, 19 of them quotes diplomatic journeys as the reason why this economic activity was initiated uh, in the first place. And I think this is really significant and as a, you know, as statistical as you can get from a medieval cave to show that uh, traveling as a diplomat uh, is really, or diplomacy in general, was a really important component of the Dunhuang economy in a way that uh, we often uh, find hard to, hard to conceptualize. I guess if you live in you know, places like ben, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Washington, D.C., right, uh, you, you can see how the state takes uh, uh, such an important role in your life and the life of the city, and uh, a place like Dunhuang is very, very similar uh, in that sense. And um, I'm just going to skip this. Uh, and uh, one last thing that I would say is, you know, I would just point out to this painting, uh, which depicts, and if you are familiar with the iconography of Chinese emperors, this looks like a Chinese emperor, but uh, it in fact is uh, uh, depicting the king of Khotan. And this is another kind of impact of the diplomatic travel that I'm seeing, which is that uh, culturally speaking, uh, this type of borrowing were really happening among the uh, imperial uh, or the state uh, political elites on the Silk Road. There are a number of questions, and, and we'll get to uh, this in the q and I'm sure, uh, that kind of restrict my, I, I want to, you know, sometimes walk back my argument a bit uh, because there are uh, remaining questions. First of all, we need to obviously think about bias in the representation of the Dunhuang documents. Dunhuang documents are not a random sample of what life was in Dunhuang at the time, so what does that tell us about uh, this issue? Um, and how can we uh, contextualize this case study in other areas, in other time periods, and, 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 and come up with a uh, comprehensive account of the history of the Silk Road? Um, but, and this is a you know, big if, if the Silk Road can be demonstrated as primarily a, uh, being primarily speaking a diplomatic network, how does that then change how we tell the history uh, of uh, uh, global connections in the pre-modern period? So these are questions that I will want to raise and hope that we can discuss. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. I've, I've talked for too long, sorry. Uh,